lecture is absolutely excellent. Um, just before I start, I want to get a bit of a show of hands. Can you put your hands up if you're familiar with BDD, Behaviour Driven Development? Okay. Um, can you put your hands up if you're familiar with Kinevin? It's not spelt like that. So one person, two people. Okay, I'm going to show you how it's spelt and then ask that question again because I normally get some more hands up at that point. Um, so I've been doing BDD since 2004. It's a long, long time. And I've started playing with some of the different spaces in which BDD doesn't really work very well. So I'm going to show you why BDD, traditionally as it's traditionally done, doesn't work in high uncertainty. And then I'm going to show you how you can use it anyway. That's the purpose of this talk. Um, I'm really excited about this talk. I wrote a blog post on which this talk is based. It's called um, Using Scenarios for Experiment Design. It's on my blog. Uh, it's about four posts back, so you can find that. And I think it's probably one of the more important blog posts I've ever written. And you're the first people to see this talk. I've also got a new questioning pattern that I use that I've never taught anybody before. It's really obvious, and we didn't think about it till last week. So I'm really excited about that as well. So just to start with, I'm going to teach you guys BDD. This is my whole morning's tutorial in five minutes. OK? You ready? You up for this? OK. Um, I will make sure these slides go somewhere and are available if the recording doesn't go out. So um, don't worry if you miss a few bits. It should be fairly obvious. BTD uses examples to illustrate behaviour. Uh, yesterday in London, there was a meetup at QCUP, so a big BDD conference in London, where they decided they were going to have a go at defining BDD again. And I, this is my definition, but I said you can't really define BDD. This is an anchor. It's not a definition, it's an anchor. It's what's at the core of BDD. But then you've got automation, you've got things like JBehave and um, Cucumber, you've got Capybara and Selenium and WebDriver. Um, there's conversations have to be part of that, unless you're working on your own, you're having your conversations with your rubber duck. This is really simply what I see BDD being. It's using examples, preferably in conversation, to illustrate behaviour. Okay, here's an example of an example. Given Fred bought a microwave, and the microwave costs £100. When we refund the microwave, then Fred should be refunded £100. Really simple. I'm working in pounds because I'm English. Um, you've all been into shops and got refunds before. You're familiar with this scenario. You know how it works. Yeah? And you can imagine that if you had some till software, you could actually perform this with the till software, scanning in Fred's receipt and, and giving him his money back. Okay? So this is a template we use in BDD. Given a context, when an event happens, then an outcome should occur. This is what most people think BDD is. A lot of people focus on the tools. Hands up if you're using Cucumber, JBehave, something like that. Yeah, it's an awful lot of you. Um, most people think that if you're using these tools, you're doing BDD. If you're not having the conversations before you use these tools, I don't think it's BDD. It's a something. It might be giving you some value, but it's not where BDD really lies. Having the conversations is the most important part of BDD. It's more important than writing those conversations down, and that's more important than automating them. And a lot of companies I do BDD with, they start just by having the conversations, and they get a lot of value out of that. Um, it's what ASLAC and I are calling shallow BDD. If you're not having conversations at all, it's not really any kind of BDD. Um, if you have nobody to have the conversations with, have it with a rubber duck. It's what we call rubber ducking. Okay. So I've shown you this template. You'll notice the word should is appearing in italics here. This is where BDD actually started. It was originally, JBehave was originally a replacement for JUnit that took the test that had to be at the beginning of test methods in JUnit 3.8 and replaced it with should. So you say, this class should do this stuff. Who knew you could do BDD at that level as well? And then, of course, JBehave, uh, JUnit 4 came out, and we no longer needed to start the words with test, and BDD as we know it today tends to be done at full system level. So we look at the behavior of whole systems. But that word should is still at the heart of it. And I prefer should to must or will because you can question it. You can ask should it. 
Should it really be doing that? Should it be doing now? Should it be doing it later? Should it be doing it in every context? And this is the first of the questioning patterns that I use. Should it? Um, there's another way that I get examples out of people and, and get different examples out of people, and it's the single simplest way to get an example from somebody. You say, can you give me an example? It's that simple. People worry a lot about give and when then. Don't worry about give and when then when you're talking to a business person. Just say, can you give me an example? And they'll say, yeah, well, if, if somebody comes in and buys white goods and then wants a refund, we should give them their money back. Okay, can you give me an example of white goods? Oh, a microwave. Okay, give me an example of a kind of customer who might buy a microwave. Oh, well, Fred, you know, he wanders in, he's got a flat cap on his head like Dan North. Um, and it's going to cost about £100. And you get these very specific scenarios that you can actually imagine. I also question um, the outcomes, whether the outcomes should always happen for different contexts. So can anyone think of a context in which Fred does not get £100? He broke the microwave himself, right? Yep, he's not going to get his money back if he broke the microwave himself. That's perfect. So that's a context. Um, so if it's on 10% discount, he only gets 90 back. Fred's not always evil, breaking microwaves. I question whether this is the only outcome that matters. And I, I say, if it, we could achieve it with pixies, would it be enough? The reason I do this is because when devs come across problems, and I know this is true because I'm a, I used to be a dev. Hands up, devs. Right? When we come across a problem, or even half a problem, we're already writing a solution in our heads. It's what we do. We're problem solvers. So I say, don't worry about the software. It's a pixie. I go to the cash machine. I ask for £20. The pixie in the cash machine gives me £20. What else does the pixie need to do? What else does the pixie need to do if he's going to give me £20? Receipts. He needs to debit my account, right? Now, that's an interesting thing. Hands up if you use user stories. As a user, I want my account to be debited. Wait, no, I don't. Some of these scenarios, the outcomes are actually not for the benefit of the user, and it's worth considering what other stakeholders are involved. In this case, the bank. The bank needs the account to be debited, not me, the user. I don't want my account to be debited. I quite like free money. Um, but the bank needs it to happen. And by considering the other stakeholders involved, you can often come up with other outcomes that need to be achieved. So here's another one. The microwave should be added to the stock count. Okay, so we're also doing the ability to count stock as well as the ability to handle refunds. Cool. This is the new one. You can get more scenarios out by just turning that outcome into a question. Should the microwave be added to the stock count? I can't believe it took a conversation with Catherine Kirk for me to think of this. I've, I probably was doing this, but just hadn't explicitly thought of it. So there you go. You're the first people I've taught this blindingly obvious thing to. OK. There's one thing I did discuss, which is um, the difference between a scenario, a specific scenario, and acceptance criteria. This is a specific scenario, specific customer. You've probably got some personas around you can use. Um, specific item, specific price. This is not a scenario. This is acceptance criteria that's phrased in scenario form. It's true for all items. When a customer gets a refund, then he should only be refunded at a discounted price. And if I see this, I'll go, OK, can you give me an example of an item? Can you give me an example of a customer? Can you give me an example of a discount? Can you give me an example of a price? until I get the specific scenarios out. And that's BDD in five minutes, thereabouts. OK? That's my whole morning's tutorial, except that normally I would get you to do a lot more practice than I've just given you. All right. I want to tell you a story. Um, this is about an organization that I worked with, one of my clients. You know what? Actually, I'm not going to tell you about one of my clients, because normally I'm under NDA. Fortunately. Um, this has happened to about three or four of my clients, and it's pretty much true for all of them. These are all clients who have business-to-business -business software. 
So they've got APIs which are being used by multiple partners, hotels, airlines, you name it, okay? I'm not going to tell you what they were doing with, with that information, but you can imagine if, you, if you're working with software that works with those kind of organizations, they might be giving you some information. They'll be filling in an API. It turns out that when you give a company an API, and that company maybe has several individual hotels in its chain, and they're all filling in the booking forms, some weird stuff can happen. You'll find there's multiple date formats. Names, which really are only two characters long, and you know, your validation is, is throwing a wobbly every time that happens. Um, my boyfriend tried to put, put his email address in one of these type of forms the other day, and his email address is mac.com. He's had that for years. Apparently that's no longer considered valid. It's too short. It's very frustrating, right? You discover how people are going to use your API. And every single one of these clients went out and got examples of the kinds of things that people were going to do with their APIs. Every single one of them. And every single one of them, on release day, discovered a bunch more stuff. It doesn't matter how many examples they get. They simply don't cover everything. And this is what happens. Whenever you do something new, you make discoveries. And you have no way of predicting what those discoveries are. They are unknown unknowns. As well as creating BDD, Dan North has come up with this thing called deliberate discovery. He says it's, it's what you do when you don't want to do accidental discovery. And accidental discovery is you go live and that's when you discover stuff. He says if you want to do deliberate discovery, maybe release to a small number of clients at a time, maybe release in a test environment, get your clients to actually try it out. What you want to do is get information early and as early as possible. So he says, first of all, you've got to assume that you're ignorant about some stuff. You don't know everything. Assume second order ignorance, and that means you don't know what it is you don't know. And then optimize for discovery. It's very closely correlated with another thing that a guy called Chris Matz came, out of, uh, came up with. And Chris is the guy who put the given in Given When Then. He was an analyst who spent a lot of time chatting with Dan back in the early days of BDD. And his principles of real options say, if you can't get that information, leave yourself some options. These are the principles he, he comes up with. Options have value. And he's, he actually used to work with financial options. And a financial option is the right, but not the obligation to do something. So I might purchase an option to buy copper at Christmas at this particular price, right? This is a financial option. And we know that financial options have value, but options in our lives have value as well. Options expire. At some point, you have to make a choice, or a choice will be made for you, and that is a choice. So for instance, I booked a plane ticket to come here. Did I have to come here on that plane? once I booked the ticket? No, it was an option. It's a, I, if I book two planes to come here, then I've got options as to which flight I take. And obviously it's slightly expensive, that option. But I don't have to take the plane, okay? And a lot of the time we think we're committing to things where actually it's just we've paid some money, we've made an investment in an option. Never commit early unless you know why. And this is the magic. If you make commitments without the right amount of information, you may find that you're wasting your investment. We used to do this back in the days of Waterfall. We would spend one project I was on a year's worth of analysis before we actually started coding. A year's worth of investment, a lot of which was then wasted as we made discoveries through coding. It was a commitment. <laughs> What we want to do is keep our options open, and Agile's very good at that. We do a little bit of analysis, and then make the discoveries, and then a bit more, and then make the discoveries. There's a book which Chris wrote, along with Olaf Marson. It's a graphical novel, and the graphics were done by Chris Geary. 
It takes a couple of hours to read. It's about a lady called Rose who's trying to save her project from being shut down. So if you want to know more about real options, this is the book to get. I'm in it. I crop up on page 76. Very tough with that. Um, this is another of my favourite books. It's called Waltzing with Bears. Tom Margot and Timothy Lister. It's a very small book. And it starts on chapter one with this in a big box. If a project has no risks, don't do it. And that is because every time we do a project or we create a project, product, there is something new. Something that we've never done before. If there wasn't, it would be the same project with the same people, same requirements, same technology, same context, everything the same. And we never do that. There's no point doing something that your company already knows how to do, has the capability for. You're doing something which is giving your organisation or your users or your business a new capability. And because it's new, you will make discoveries. And because you will make discoveries, there is risk. So I'm going to show you how to use BDD to explore that space. Before I do, I want to introduce you to something which is the vocabulary I use when I'm talking about risk. It's called Kinevin. Now you see how it's spelled. That's the hardest thing about Kinevin, is being able to spell it. Those people who've now seen that word up there, how many of you have heard of it now? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so it's more than when I ask without you seeing it written down. Um, Kinevin is a framework for looking at different situations, depending on how much uncertainty there is in them. And the most certain kind of situation is an obvious one. It used to be called simple. I used to call this the simple domain. These are domains, not quadrants. The boundaries are fuzzy and things move around within the Kinevin framework. Um, an obvious problem is one which a child could solve, or if it does require expertise, the solution is obvious. So I was talking to my landlady in my pub, She's the person who runs the pub, and I said, you know, you run out of beer. Now, I don't know how to solve that problem. I imagine you do, because you know you change the barrels, and you know how to do that. She said, yep. I said, right, but it's an obvious problem. You run out of beer, you change the barrels. Okay? Um, as a child, your chain falls off your bicycle, you put it back on again. But as you start getting more and more complicated problems, they start requiring more and more expertise. So you can imagine a child's jigsaw with six pieces is fairly easy. An adult's jigsaw with a thousand is a bit trickier. A watch that might have a thousand parts, a watchmaker can take that apart and put it back together again. And lots of things in the complicated space are mechanical and made up of parts. Cars, a mechanic can fix your car. You can see the problem and the outcome is predictable. You know what it is you're trying to achieve in the complicated space. Cause and effect are correlated, but you need expertise to make that correlation. But the most interesting domain from a software perspective is the complex one. In the complex domain, cause and effect are correlated in retrospect. It's high uncertainty. Outcomes emerge over time. So my favourite example of this is a company called Ludicor. Um, they had a big multiplayer game called NeverEnding, big online multiplayer game, and they wanted to get more people to come and play this game. So what they did, they set up a site where people could share screenshots of the game. They thought, well, let's get people to, to share screenshots of warriors fighting and mages throwing spells, and everybody will see how awesome our game is, and, and then they'll come and play our game. So I set this site up and people started putting screenshots on the site and photos of kittens and holiday snaps and photos of their family and that became Flickr. Started as a multiplayer game. You could never have predicted that. That's an example of what we call exaptation. Something being used not for the purpose for which it was originally intended or designed. Another example is feathers. Feathers were originally insulation for the dinosaurs. And then one day a dinosaur could fly. And now birds have feathers. There is another domain. 
It's one we try to avoid most of the time. There are ways of using it constructively. It's called the chaotic domain. Um, chaos usually resolves itself quickly and not in your favour. Cause and effect cannot be correlated at all until you get out of chaos. So your house is burning down, somebody's bleeding to death. You don't know why, you don't know what's happened to them. All you know is you need to stop the bleeding, you need to get out of the house. And when it's safe, then you can actually look and say, oh, okay, I can see why that happened. You suddenly skid on the road in your car. You don't sit there going, oh, that's funny, I just skidded. I wonder what's happened as you go sailing off the road. You get control of your car. You have to act in chaos. So in the obvious domain, we can categorise the problem. We say it's one of those problems. We know how to solve it. In the complicated domain, we analyse the problem. And analysis works. In the complex domain, we have to do what's called probe. Experiment. Try things out. And in the chaotic domain, we have to act. There is another domain in the middle that's called disorder. Disorder is the domain where we don't know which of the other four dominates, so we behave according to our preferred domain. If you've ever had a project manager who sat asking you for accurate estimates in your planning sessions, which domain do they think they're operating in? The predictable side, right? The complicated or the, or the obvious side. Estimates work very well when things are predictable, but if you've never done something before, you have no idea what you're going to discover, and so very little idea of how long it's going to take. BDD, the use of examples to analyze and discover requirements through conversation, works really well about that. In the obvious domain, it gets boring. We used to use logging in as a scenario for BDD. I'm so sorry we ever did that. You know what logging in looks like. I don't need to talk through the scenarios for a good password, a bad password, and it, you know. We just need to have the discussion about what makes a good password and then go code the thing. Or say, let's log in using Google. Or let's log in using Twitter. We don't need to have a discussion about those scenarios. I normally say you can just name the scenarios and then be done with it. It's user registration. We create a user, update a user, delete a user. All good. I want to show you how to use BDD scenarios in this space, the complex space, the emergent one, the one in which we make discoveries. And I want to show you how to use them for trying things out. I already said this has other names. Probe is the name that we normally use in complexity thinking. You're probably more familiar, especially at this conference, with the word experiment. Andrea Pavaglio was talking about it yesterday. Claudio Perrin talked about it this morning. People have been mentioning Kinevin. Tom Gill mentioned it. So I want to talk about safe to fail probes. An experiment has to be safe to fail. Otherwise, it's not an experiment, it's a commitment. And we don't want to be committing when we have uncertainty. Options are very valuable in uncertainty. So here's what makes a good experiment. You have to have a way of knowing that the experiment is succeeding. You have to have a way of knowing when it's failing. You have to have a way of dampening it, and that means stopping the experiment from continuing if it's failing or minimising the impact of that experiment. And you have to have a way of amplifying it, making it bigger, anchoring it, making sure it continues. And the last thing you have to have is coherence. And that means a realistic reason for thinking that the probe might have a positive impact. Now, you might not know what the outcome of your experiment is going to be, but you better have a, a, a reason for thinking that it's realistic. The way I phrase this, because I'm into BDD, is can you think of a scenario in which this experiment succeeds? And it's not a test. It's just an example of what might happen. It's an example of something good. Bitcoin is a bit of an experiment. I've seen all kinds of good things happen as a result of Bitcoin, people tipping each other all over Reddit for nice things that people have said, you know? 
There's generosity associated with it. There may be some bad things associated with it as well, if you've ever followed um, the McGox, Antigox um, scandal from last year. Somebody managed to disappear with a whole load of bitcoins. So we also need to worry about the failure scenarios. But the success scenarios are the ones which tell us we have a coherent experiment. Here's a success scenario. This is one from life, this isn't software. Given my boyfriend and I have been going out for four years, when we move in with each other, then we should be really happy together. That's got a fairly high cost of failure, right? I'll tell you, I've been engaged twice. I have moved in with people twice before, and it didn't work out. It turns out I'm an introvert and quite a picky person to live with. And I really like my own space. So I wasn't really in a hurry to do this. It's why we've been going out for four years before we tried this. I moved in with my boyfriend two weeks ago. It's going okay so far. We've got the two of everything problem. But it's an experiment with a fairly high cost of failure, you would have thought. I mean, I remember the last two times that this didn't work. It was painful, really painful. Let's look at a software one. Given Fred has signed up for Appytastic, I made up the name, Appytastic. Um, it's based on a real app. When we sync to Facebook by default, so you can imagine it's a video app, and when you take a video, it notifies people on Facebook. Now, you can turn that off, but by default, when you sign up for a new account, it's turned on. And so all of Fred's friends get to see that he's made a video with Appytastic on his, his Facebook feed and they see how awesome Appytastic is, and, and they sign up. That's the idea, right? We get better sign up. Can't see anything going wrong with that, can you? Let's have a look at failure scenarios. We need to understand what failure looks like as well. So what might happen when my boyfriend and I move in with each other? If it goes wrong, we might get on each other's nerves and realise that this really isn't working, right? That's a thing that might happen. We've never tried this before, it's new. Let's look at um, Fred signing up for Appytastic. Now, what happens when you notify Facebook of things by default? Hmm? You accidentally upload something that you meant to keep private, right? Oops, now all your friends can see that you're secretly a stamp collector or whatever it is you're trying to hide. <laughs> so you might find out that um, Fred and Fred's friends see that Appytastic has privacy issues and they go, oh, that's really bad. So we have the ways of knowing it's succeeding. We're really happy together. Fred, friend, see how awesome Appytastic is and sign up. Hands up if you were in Tom Gilb's keynote. What does Tom say about this kind of requirement? Put some numbers on it. Okay, you can measure happiness on a scale of one to five, where five is blissful and one is miserable. My life before I moved in was a four, I reckon. So my, my boyfriend's got his work cut out to make it even better. Sign-up rates increases. Can you think of an example of how much they might increase by? If you're not certain about what might happen, get a range from the people who know about this stuff. You know? And then you've got a range between 5 and 15% extra sign-ups. And you can actually make a value judgment about how much that's worth, how much the experiment might be worth. A way of knowing that it's failing. Again, Think of the metrics. But remember that you get what you measure. So you might want to just measure the positive things and focus on getting more of them. You want more sign-up rates. You want more positive tweets. You might measure the, the proportion of tweets that are positive. And you can do that just with a sample. You don't have to count them all. You might go, OK, let's look at one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon and see what kind of tweets are coming out. Whenever I do these experiments and I teach people how to do this, I find that all human beings seem obsessed with failure. And they will come up with so many failure scenarios. 
What if the third party system doesn't work that way? What if the release has a bug in it? What if our people don't have the skills? What if someone gives away the admin password? What if AWS fails? What if a meteor hits our data center? Right? They think of all these failure modes. So a safe to fail probe has to have a way of avoiding failure completely. No, wait. If it had that, it wouldn't be an experiment. If you only ever do the safe experiments, you only do the ones where success is guaranteed, then you are doing it when you've done it before. Those are the only things where you're guaranteed success. You've done it before, so you know it'll work. In the same context, with the same requirements, and the same people, and the same technology, and the same market, and all of this stuff changes. You're never doing the same thing that you've done before. This is why uncertainty always exists. In fact, this all changes so much that just even to get this, you would have to have a time machine. Okay? And if any of you have one of those, please come and talk to me afterwards. You've all fallen asleep after lunch, I can tell. Make it cheap to fail. Rather than worrying about failure, just check that it's cheap to fail. Use the scenarios to look at the cost of failure and find ways to make it cheap. My boyfriend and I have been going out for four years. Fortunately, he is also familiar with Kinevin. And that means we can have really adult conversations of the kind that I can't have with people who don't think in this way. We are renting for a year. We've got a place together for a year. We've not bought anything. We've not made a commitment, not made a massive investment. We're renting for one year. If it works out, we can decide whether to continue, get more information. Or maybe we'll decide, you know, the London market's fallen, if only, and we can finally afford a house there, you know? We can look at where we are and decide what to do next. This isn't a decision that we've made. It's an experiment that we're, we're performing together. If you've got Appytastic and this default, you know, by default it goes to Facebook, what might you do to make that really cheap to fail? You might roll it out to only a few people. Or you can make it really easy to change so that you can wind it back very quickly if it turns out that this was a bad idea. Put the flag on the server where you can change it easily. You know how long it takes to get things into the Apple Store? Hands up if you, you do app, Apple development. Yeah. It takes a while. It's one of the reasons why people are nowadays doing a lot more work on Android first, because then you can get feedback on your app really quickly, because it's much easier to get things into the Android store. And then you go through the long process of getting things approved for the Apple store. If we did this for everything, it would be a bit painful. It would be a lot of overhead. So I have this scale I use to help me work out what to do it with. Okay, it's really simple scale. It's on my blog. Five, nobody in the world has ever done this before. It is completely new. Landing on Mars, making um, driverless cars road legal. We will make discoveries. Four, someone outside the org has done it before, probably a competitor but nobody in our organization has done it. Three, someone in the company's done it for, someone in our organization, or we have access to the expertise. Two, someone in the team's done it for, one, we all know how to do it. The fives and the fours are complex. The three is complicated. Two is only marginally complicated, and we're usually domain experts, so you don't need to worry about it. You can treat it as simple, obvious. And one, don't worry about it. The twos and ones, just get them done. You're going to get them right, and they're not going to change either. Not unless you're deliberately trying to innovate in that space. Login, user registration. Three, stuff that is fairly fixed, but you might need some expertise, GPS systems, for instance. 
And then fives and fours are your differentiators. They're the reason you're doing the project, the creating the product, right? I was teaching this scale to a nun software team. And this guy showed him this scale. He said, but the fives and fours are where the value is. I said, yep. He said, and it's where the risk is. I said, yep. He said, so we should be doing those first, early to make the discoveries while we still have time to react. I said, yes. He said, but the entire industry does it the other way around. I said, yes, yes, they do. And we frequently see this even in agile projects. Everything that can be analyzed ends up on the backlog first. And the risky stuff, we push back on it. We say, you know, oh no, we need more analysis on that. No, we, we need our scenarios. We need to have clear outcomes for this. If you ever get anything like that, ask yourself, is it new? Is it something that we've never done before in this organization? And if it is, jump on it, do a spike, do a prototype. Devs, you have so much power here. You know how easy it would be to knock something up just to get something that you can then get some information on, make some decisions with. Moving it from the complex domain to the complicated. This is how those numbers fall into place on Kinevin. You'll notice I don't worry about chaos with this. Heaven help you if you're doing anything in chaos other than stemming the flow, acting to remove the chaos. Get yourself into a safe place where you can then try something out to fix the problem long term. So unfamiliar scenarios. If you have scenarios you've never come across before, they're fives and fours. And then as the scenarios become more familiar, you end up with the point where coherence is so, it's so coherent, you're now down into that obvious territory. Okay? Disaster movies down in chaos. I like disaster movies. I love 2012 is one of my favorite movies. They always make me feel so much better about my own life. But if you're thinking of disaster movie scenarios, think of ways that you might make it safe to fail, okay? I'm gonna show you this. This is um, BDD for life. This is another talk I do. It's just a little bit that I, I cover at the end of it. Just to show you how to use experiments really constructively. If you're chasing some outcome, and in life we have what's called well-formed outcomes, we measure things by what we can see, what we can hear, what we can touch, smell, taste, maybe a kinesthetic feeling, you know. I will know I've run my 10K well because I will feel a sense of pride, and we know what pride feels like, okay? So we might have that as an outcome. We have an event which leads to the outcome. I will get that sense of pride because I'm going to run a 10K race. And then we have a context reality. It's all good, right? Positive visualization. If you want something enough, all you need to do is visualize it positively and you will achieve it. I'm probably not going to do very well in a 10K race right now because I'm not very fit. I haven't done a lot of running. I've been too busy moving house. So I've got this unwanted context. And it's going to lead to an unwanted outcome. I feel bad about my performance in a 10K race. We don't want that. So what we do is something called a given scenario. We're going to replace this context with a better one. Or we're going to add a context which nullifies it. I'm going to get fit and then I will be able to run my 10K. That replacement context then becomes the outcome that you're looking for for a new scenario. This is what we call an oblique experiment. It's not an experiment which is actually going for the outcome. It's an experiment which is going for some of the context in which that outcome exists or in which you want to achieve that outcome. So you're changing the environment to put yourself in a better environment. If you can't make changes to get the outcome you want, you can always do this. You can always put yourself in a better place. 
And just think of an event which will lead, something you could do that will lead to that better thing. Something you can try that might lead to that better thing. This is how we change reality. Trust is what you do when you don't have any options. And if you're doing it in high uncertainty, it is really dangerous. Lots of people talk about the value of trust. I actually like to use it as a test to see whether we're coming up with good experiments or not. To see whether we're providing the options. Options in uncertainty are better than blind trust. Make it safe to fail. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>